About a third of all human deaths are from poverty-related causes, 18 out of 57 million every year. And that's a very conservative statistic in that I have here only counted those deaths that are from causes that are essentially unknown in the rich countries. I have not counted all those people who die in poor countries from diseases that we know only too well, like diabetes, heart attack, and so on. If you put that in perspective, you come to about 400 million deaths from poverty in the last 22 years, since the end of the Cold War. And that's more than or about twice as many deaths as died in the entire 20th century from all government-sponsored violence, wars, civil wars, gulags, concentration camps, Mao Zedong's Great Leap Forward. In a whole century, that amounted to 200 million deaths, of course way too many, but poverty kills 400 million in just 22 years. The old world is ending. And we have the opportunity to rethink everything. This is a show about the systemic problems in our world. And the real solutions we have today. To transition from an apocalyptic storm of war, scarcity, and ecological collapse. To create an abundantly advanced collaborative society. That sustains all life. You may think it's an impossible dream. But the alternative is an inevitable nightmare. We're your hosts, Matt Holton, Amanda Smith, and Zachary Marlowe. And together, we can move past this economic absurdity and come together to actualize our collective potential to create something completely new. We are Mindless Society. Society. I read from World Poverty and Human Rights by Thomas Poggy. Despite a high and growing global average income, billions of human beings are still condemned to lifelong severe poverty with all its attendant evils of low life expectancy, social exclusion, ill health, illiteracy, dependency, and effective enslavement. The annual death toll for poverty related causes is around 18 million, adds up to approximately 270 million deaths since the end of the Cold War. This problem is hardly unsolvable. Citizens of the rich countries are, however, conditioned to downplay the severity and persistence of world poverty and to think of it as an occasion for minor charitable assistance, thanks in part to the rationalizations dispensed by our economists. Few realize that severe poverty is an ongoing harm we inflict upon the global poor. If more of us understood the true magnitude of the problem of poverty and our causal involvement in it, we might do what is necessary to eradicate it. That world poverty is an ongoing harm we inflict seems completely incredible to most citizens of the affluent countries. We call it tragic that the basic human rights of so many remain unfulfilled and are willing to admit that we should do more to help. But it is unthinkable to us that we are actively responsible for this catastrophe. If we were, then we civilized and sophisticated denizens of the developing countries would be guilty of the largest crime against humanity ever committed, the death toll of which exceeds every week that of the recent tsunami, and every three years, that of World War II, the concentration camps and gulags included. What could be more preposterous? So we welcome to the show the great Thomas Poggy with a, a list of uh, credibilities and, and uh, uh, universities that he works with and institutions that is just literally too long for me to address. Thomas is an extremely uh, well positioned person to answer this great question, this huge question, one of the most important of our times. Thomas, what is global poverty and just how bad is it? What is the state of, of this issue? Yeah, so global poverty is basically the fact that a very large number of people in the world are not being able to meet their basic needs. So you can just define it in absolute terms, relatively narrowly, and say that people are poor insofar as they can't meet their needs, insofar as they don't have the wherewithal for a healthy life. So one statistic that is turned out by the UN sub-organizations that comes sort of reasonably close to identifying the poor is the number of people who cannot afford a healthy diet. This is a statistic that they have now put in after much criticism of their uh, hunger numbers, which I thought were much too narrow, their definition of 
undernourishment. So uh, they think that you need about the equivalent of $3.54 in the U.S. today to be able to afford a healthy diet. If you live in the United States, if you have $3.54 per day, you can afford a healthy diet. So that gives you a rough sense of what they mean by that. Now, the percentage of humanity who cannot afford a healthy diet by that standard is 42%. 42% of the people on this earth cannot afford, do not have that $3.54 that would be required to buy the food for a healthy diet. Uh, that's about the extent of it. And of course, these people are not only short of food, but they are sure short of many other things as well, as you can easily imagine. Now, we have to contrast that number, that 354, with the number 59, which is the purchasing power that human beings on average have. We live in a world where the average income is $59, and 42% of the human population cannot afford $3.54 for food. This, according to the statistics that the UN sub-organizations, which are heavily dominated by governments, are themselves cranking out. These statistics are dubious in various ways, but even by their own statistics, this is how it looks. And of course, that's grotesque, given that there is so much money in the world. We are collectively so rich that so many people should be struggling every day just to get by that children should be growing up in households where the parents simply cannot feed them, cannot provide them the kind of diet that they need. Uh, I, I want to ask a question, Thomas, about the, the poverty line, because from my understanding, the poverty line globally is around $2.90 a day or something like that. And I just, I just have to kind of stand back and, and shake my head at that because it seems really insane that that's what we say, somebody's at $2.91 a day, that they're not in poverty. Yeah, the poverty line is, uh, of course, is chosen to be quite low. And that is not only to minimize the number of poor people, but it is also to uh, make the progress appear quite dramatic. So when you look at the statistics of the World Bank, poverty has decreased pretty radically over the years sort of since about 1990 to today, pretty steadily decreased. The number of people who cannot uh, afford sufficient food has always, in, not always, but increased since 2014. So it's interesting to see those two numbers diverge. And the reason why they diverge is because the World Bank is measuring poverty against a global goods and services basket. It basically takes the average consumption of the world at large as the consumption basket and then calculates how much income poor people have relative to that basket. Now, that basket, of course, consists of many different things. And the one thing that's really important to poor people is food. And if food gets more expensive relative to other things, then the poor become worse off, even if their income relative to the standard basket remains the same. So what's happened, to simplify a little bit, is food prices have gone up, uh, computer prices have gone down, electronics and so forth. And so we attribute to the poor more purchasing power, even while they have less purchasing power relative to what they really need to buy. Oh my gosh, that is a profound distinction to make. The purchasing power they have relative to what they need to survive, their basic needs, access of food, shelter, health care, and so on. So glad to hear that distinction be made. Uh, you hear a lot of people making the comments, well, if they can afford a smartphone, then they can afford to pay their rent, or they can afford to eat well and not be on food stamps or whatnot. But you just, uh, you just clarified uh, all of that and summed up why that is not so. So thankful for that. That. I have a question for you when it comes to the statistics that you're telling us about right now. How uh, does global supply chain and um, the 
illogical, wasteful logistics of day-to-day operations and institutions here in America contribute to the the poverty rate. And to dial that in just a little bit more as an example, like I've been doing a study of sorts lately, um, how wasteful nursing homes happen to be with their Mm -hmm. food, how many plates of food they throw away each day, how many plates are touched, how many are consumed, and then drinks and then paper products and then energy used to create all this food that ultimately is not ingested is not actually used. But then you've got people, like you said, who can't meet that bare minimum uh, poverty line just to feed themselves. How do those two play at odds? Well, uh, we are competing with the global poor for resources. So, for example, for land use, that is the most obvious thing, right? So we, for example, like to eat beef and hamburgers. Uh, To raise beef, you need a lot of land. And we outfit the poor with regard to land use. So we have stronger purchasing power. If we want to eat beef, then that means that farmers all over the world have an incentive to devote their land to raising cattle rather than to planting soybeans or the kind of things that poor people would find important for their diet. So all these prices are interrelated with each other uh, because they're ultimately competing about uh, for the same basic resources, labor, land, and capital. And so this is one of the reasons why food prices have risen, because there are all these other competing uses. I want to give you one more example in addition to the one you mentioned, that's biofuels, right? So we think we are wonderful green citizens. We are mixing biofuels into our Uh, into our fuel here for the cars that we drive. And that is by itself an absolutely horrendous quantity of land that is needed to grow the corn that is then used for biofuel. Uh, In some cases, also sugar, sugar cane that they grow for biofuel. So, and that also competes, of course, for land use. And so often poor people live in countries that have plenty of land and could grow plenty of food and maybe even do grow plenty of food. But of course, the food travels to where the highest bid for it exists, where most is paid for it. And if the US or China or some other country outbids uh, the local wholesalers, then the food will just be exported and the people in the country will be empty-handed. And not to mention the degradation of soil and farming land in those areas where nothing but corn and grain are raised than the people who would otherwise raise uh, more consumable things in a diverse um, amount of of things don't have that ground to even do so with. Yeah, that's that's like so apparent when you uh, travel through you know, South America, I'm in Colombia right now, and the slash and burn agriculture is so obvious because you'll see these pristine mountain ranges with jungles that are just mm-hmm. covered with trees. And then there's these patches, like someone took one of those, uh, like, like hair removal patches and just a wax sh- strip. Just off. Yeah, yeah, that's terrible. They're just, they're just badly wax stripping the, uh, the mountains. I wanted to, to um, ask Thomas about those numbers that the World Bank and other institutions say about poverty is reducing, poverty is going down, and people always say capitalism has raised X number of people out of poverty, and the number of poor people in the world is going down. And I like point out statistics like the fact, like like the ones that you're uh, people like you were developing and working with, and people will say things like, "Oh well, but the that's it, the number's gone down, obviously. You know, oh, 18 million people dying of poverty. Obviously, you know, humanity is so much more advanced. It was probably 27 million before. You know, people just assume these things because of these numbers that are being thrown around and, you know, 2.9 and 3.4 and 600 and 26. You know, it's just you can easily get lost in these numbers. So is poverty really decreasing or is it increasing? Yeah, so it depends on the time period in the In the last eight years or so, uh, poverty has gotten worse by any reasonable standard relative, again, to the needs of poor people. The World Bank uh, will still say that poverty has fallen relative to the general consumption basket, but that's simply the wrong way to measure it. One other thing that we should always keep in mind is that, uh, as you have said now several times, poor people die in very large numbers. And so to some extent, if you look year by year and say, oh, there are fewer people, fewer 
poor people in the world than they were last year. Progress, progress. Well, it isn't progress if right. a lot of people have died and are just wow. no longer around. Oh, it's right? only progress for and Wall Street. It, it just, yeah, maybe. But you see that it is the absurdity of the way in which we measure poverty that is is stunning, right? We have to measure poverty in a whole different way. Uh, something like a third of all people of all people in the world, right, die uh, from poverty-related causes. So each year, if you look at the total number of deaths, it's roughly a third of uh, those deaths are poverty-related in one way or the other through no food, no access to medicines, and so on and so forth. And that, of course, always decimates the number of poor people and then leads to slight progress, maybe in the number of those who are remaining. But again, that is uh, a tragedy rather than progress. Yeah, I just want to kind of uh, go into that for a minute because that's really, that fact right there is, is the reason that we're having this conversation right now. And I've spent the last week or so diving into it and just trying to really fathom what that means. And and uh, I, just fr from the time that I heard that that figure that 18 million people die every year, which I, I think is, is, is a, a low figure, I think it's more. And I think you would actually possibly agree with that. But it's just this fact that it's just unfathomable that there is, as James Gilligan said in this great quote, where he's basically like, this is the effect, in effect, an accelerating thermonuclear holocaust on the poor and the weak every single day. That a child dies of hunger every 10 seconds. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Dead child, you know? People are dying every single second. As I see the waveform of my microphone going by, people are dying. And, and I just think it's unfathomable when you present people with these statistics and they just simply ignore them. They cannot fathom that, that scale of death. I just want to piggyback off of that and circle back around to the piece that you read in the beginning that Thomas here wrote. And I'll be honest, that's the first time I had heard that piece of yours. And I am a student of yours today as I'm still getting acquainted with your work, but nonetheless, absolutely thrilled. But to get to the point, um, you so eloquently summed up both the origins of poverty to some degree, but also why we don't address it. Um, and when Marlowe talks about the severity of poverty at this point in, in human history, for me, it's unfathomable why we wouldn't want to first accept that we've made a mistake and perhaps been doing things uh, incorrectly, for lack of a better term, and that we could do them better and stop the murder machine. Like, I can't wrap my head around why somebody wouldn't want to go, oh, you know what? I, I, I am sorry that people are dying all the time and I'm part of an oppressive system that I can't escape um, the mechanisms of unless we change it. I guess I'm just biased, but it reminds me of a scenario that took place not too long ago where somebody asked me, it was a job interview to be candid, and they said, what would you do in the instance that you realized you made a mistake about this, uh, you know, scenario? Um, would you try to stop the uh, mistake from, you know, following through, or, or would you just let it happen and tell somebody later and so on and so forth? And I think this is a great application for that example. If somebody said to me, uh, the system we live in is killing a child every 10 seconds, would you like to stop that or just let it continue and tell somebody about it later? I think I would choose to stop it and do something about it. And and how, how my question to you, Thomas, is how do we get people to accept their responsibility and this murder machine and stop it and build a machine that is efficient and life supporting. Yeah, you have jumped a few steps ahead, right? The, the first thing is you have to get people to recognize what the suffering on earth really is, how right. many people are dying from poverty and so on. But then there is the next step, which is the step of explanation. Why is this happening? And here, of course, people will gravitate in the direction of anodyne explanations. They will say, you know, Africa, it's always been poor. These people Ideologies. there, this is difficult. I know it's a mess over there. I, I know people are suffering over there. It's true. And maybe I should give more to help or something. But it has nothing to do with us in the sense that we play any kind of causal role with this. No, 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 no. Uh, we have, through hard work and good fortune, managed to create a, a bubble, sort of an oasis in the North Atlantic region where we are prosperous and we have worked for this. 
And uh, the poor Africans have somehow not managed to do that. And I'm sorry for that. But there's only so much I can do, you know, and it's a difficult world out there. And yes, I make an occasional donation, but uh, the idea that I have any kind of responsibility for that is just too far-fetched for most people to fathom. So, and then, of course, you have to say two things. One thing is, uh, what about history? Have you ever heard about genocide, slavery, colonialism, and so on, right? So it's not exactly a coincidence that we have done so well and that they have done so poorly, that there's this enormous inequality accumulated over two, two or three centuries. And then the second thing is how this enormous inequality gets stabilized. It gets stabilized, of course, through governments setting the terms of international trade, international finance, and so on. And they're setting these terms at conferences where their bargaining power is decisive. The U.S. sits at the table, Senegal sits at the table, Cameroon, China. And obviously, these countries differ incredibly in terms of the influence they can exert on those terms. And they use their influence, often driven by their local constituents. So the U.S. policy, as you probably know, is very heavily driven by U.S. corporations. And these U.S. corporations want the U.S. government to bring home the bacon, to bring home to them, you know, favorable terms of interaction with other countries. So at the global level, this very intricate and dense structure of rules and institutions and practices that governs our world is designed with tender loving care for the rich, by the rich, for the rich, and it is designed in such a way that they get, for example, the resources they want from developing countries, that they get the labor that they want from developing countries and so forth. Uh, I think John Perkins would have been a great person to have uh, present here also because of what he could lend to that part of the discussion. Um, but that that's another talk for another day, and I encourage our listeners to check that episode out too. I just wanted to slip that in there because that's a whole other element that needs to be explored and understood in order to arrive at the conclusion, the collective conclusion, like I was getting to and getting ahead of, um, and that's the fact that you know where does poverty come from, how do we participate in it, and why should we overcome it? I, we can, I want to keep exploring that territory there, but a little quick question, like how do you deal with people in these sorts of fields and, and NGOs and all these people that are trying to scratch the poverty itch and trying to establish themselves and make a nice little NGO, you know, sending, uh, you know, donations to Africans for as little as a cup of coffee a day, you know, how do you talk to these people or people like Bill Gates or, you know, these these kinds of people, these kinds of capitalists with the mentality that, you know, poverty is the fault of not enough innovation or people not pulling themselves up by their bootstraps or Bill Gates' weird fixation on like lowering birth rates, or, you know, like all these weird loop-de-loop explanations for poverty that avoid the obvious truth that the wealth of the rich nations was carved out of the poor nations. And as the great Michael Parenti said, you know, the third world is not underdeveloped, it is overexploited. Yeah. Yeah, so, uh, I mean, Gates is really a miraculous story. I don't know what one could do to persuade him, but uh, one wonderful piece of reading that I recommend to you is uh, he writes an annual letter about his foundation and all the good that his foundation has done in the world. And I think it's the 2017 letter that is the absolute height. You know, he was given, as you probably also know, from Warren Buffett, he was given billions and billions and billions of dollars for the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And billions when, and billions and billions, <laughs> yes. When, <laughs> to save the world and end poverty. Warren Buffett <laughs> asked him, you know, what have you achieved with this? He was talking about all the hundreds of millions of lives that he has saved. And his mathematics is simply that uh, there were so many children who died in 1990, uh, and now fewer children die because people get fewer children this, these days. And so uh, he says that the difference between the annual child deaths between those two years are children we have saved. 
Now, uh, of course, many of these children live in China. Uh, Bill Gates has absolutely nothing to do with poverty reduction in China, but he claims credit for the whole lot of it as if he had any, you know, obviously there was a global economic growth and there was a reduction in birth rate, a pretty dramatic reduction in birth rate, simply based on women's preferences about how many children they want to have, better birth control and so on. And to sell that as an enormous kind of progress and saving people is just bizarre. But again, that's the, the mathematics and he's deeply entrenched in this. And of course, he's very deeply invested in this exploitative model of saying that we in the West, we come up with innovations and these innovations, we are willing to share them with the world. Other people can also use Microsoft Word or whatever, but they have to pay a road toll for that. And that road toll, of course, is killing people all over the world, all over the poorer countries, in particular in pharmaceuticals, right? And where uh, it's not surprising that people with capital, both education and financial capital, can reach innovations before people who have poor education and no resources to run a laboratory, for example. But then for the rich people to say, oh, we got to this milestone first. We have the right now to veto anybody else using it is just bizarre. But that is one of the deepest commitments of Bill Gates. He really is deeply committed to this idea that somebody who reaches an innovation can veto anybody else using it without paying for authorization. Uh, so in all you said there, I gathered something I think um, should be brought to the surface in certain terms, and that's the fact that philanthropists uh, cherry pick statistics to some degree in order to make their innovations seem fruitful and beneficial to society in order to gain support, of course, and to, you know, with, withhold their status uh, position and status quo. Um, and I think that's important to point out because it's another form of propaganda that uh, blinds people to the actual um grim reality of the the rate of poverty that we're discussing here today i, I just wanted to say real quick because uh I, I was laughing i just keep i just keep like having these little la bursts of laughter because it's like i've had such a there's been such a pressure like fathoms of pressure on me in studying this and really really trying to reckon and fathom just how bad things are and i was uh, in a deep hole of research you know really weighing on this and I've been traveling around the last few days just trying to find a place where we could do this podcast you know everything just keeps going wrong and falling apart and the internet goes out and the a rainstorm knocks out the power in the whole town because that's another effect of poverty that we're experiencing shitty infrastructure that's kept shitty on purpose yes. because innovation is blocked in so many other ways in these poor countries and I just I, I like I smoked a joint and walked around to this little beach town and like came out of this fog of doom that I was in for days. And I just, I, I caught a whiff of my own absurdity. I'm wearing this bright yellow shirt and walking around with a funny hat, smoking a joint in this surfer hippie town with no shoes on. And I just realized like, I'm a hippie, you know, I'm like, I should be under a tree, like laughing and bobbing my head with a blade of grass between my teeth, like writing a poem. Like how have things gotten so bad, so fucking bad that poets have to like concern themselves with the, with the, state of global poverty and the reality of like the children of the world starving and dying and it's just it's it's very refreshing to meet people like you thomas who are just day in and day out in such an organized and meticulous way you know dealing with this and and cr compiling hard data to cr make this compelling powerful case to end and eradicate that's the word you use to eradicate poverty when it's well within our grasp. I and mean, that's something that really strikes me in your writing and that you just continually say like, this is fucking solvable. This is not a real problem. I mean, it is a real problem, but it, it's a contrivance of, as you said, one particular mode of organization. And I, I would like to know, um, I'd like, what, do you, what to you, what is that one particular mode of organization? Anyone who listens to our show knows we have an answer for that question that's very clear, but I want to know what your answer is. What is the one particular mode of, of social and political and economic organization that creates the situation? Well, uh, at the, the root of it all is uh, the politics, right? That the way in which our world is structured uh, is politically decided 
in ways that give a very small minority an overwhelming say in how it's structured. And then uh, there are many different structurings that are important. So you can look at the global financial system, for example, the way debt works, the way taxation works, uh, the way investment works. These are structures that very systematically benefit the people with money over the people without money or with very little money, and thereby entrench the inequality and tend to aggravate it. So uh, taxes, we all know that rich people notoriously pay no taxes uh, or very little. Why do they pay no taxes? Well, because they have the political power to structure the tax system in such a way that they can escape taxation. You pay no taxes on unrealized capital gains, for example. So you can accumulate billions and billions and billions and thereby have a tremendous income in the sense of becoming richer and richer without ever paying a penny in taxes on it. Whereas somebody who has labor income, of course, cannot evade taxation, it's simply withdrawn out of the paycheck. Uh, similarly with corporations doing business in the developing world, right? They never pay taxes there. Why do they not pay taxes there? Because they have no profit there. Why do they have no profit there? Because they have sibling companies that are affiliated with the same multinational corporation in tax havens, and they shuffle their profits from the country in which they do business to the tax haven. For example, by uh, having the trademark registered in the British Virgin Islands, and then they pay a very high fee for permission to use that trademark in, let's say, Zambia, and thereby dissipate any profit that they've made in Zambia. That profit goes for paying for the trademark. And in the British Virgin Island, of course, there is no taxation of corporations. So there's also no tax to be paid there. So this is another aspect, the global financial system. But then you have uh, debt, you have trade and so on. In all these different respects, our international system is systematically structured in such a way that the surplus accumulates in very few pockets. Do you feel that money plays any certain role in that root of politics and all the things you discussed? Yeah, of course, it plays a decisive role, right? In, I mean, one of the things that I'm now involved with is uh, the attempt to get super PACs limited in terms of how much funding they can receive and dispense. So the US system is a, a very clear cut case of one dollar, one vote. You pay for the outcomes. You cannot be a senator or a congressperson without spending very large amounts of money on your re-elections, which are quite frequent. And where is this money gonna come from? Well, it's gonna come from people like Paul Singer and Crow who also now buy our Supreme Court justices in, into the bargain. And so the political system is run on the basis of money. Mm. Of course, votes also matter, but votes can, in a highly depoliticized population, can relatively easily be purchased simply by a lot of propaganda. Yes. So money is the lifeblood of American politics. And uh, that makes the U.S. government an extremely powerful agent in the hands of big corporations and billionaires, especially when the U.S. plays a role in setting the terms of international collaboration. Right? The U.S. is the big uh, gorilla in the room in the World Trade Organization and anywhere at the U.N. Uh, Security Council. It is militarily extremely powerful. And so, of course, it has a tremendous say over the structuring of international collaboration. Excellent. Thank you. Quick, uh, quick statistic here. 88%, uh, uh, this is from, from 2000 to 2016, a study on uh, money and politics concluded that 88% of House candidates who outspent their opponents won their elections, and the Senate, the rate was 92%. So I don't know what you'd call that, but it's certainly not democracy. It's certainly not uh, the people deciding collectively who represents them 
and ultimately what policies are made. I mean, that's that's really the smoking gun in terms of U.S. politics. And then that political power ultimately translates to the rest of the world. I mean, it, you sent me a, a fantastic piece on basically it was like about how liberalism and the ideals of Western democracies are eaten by the Western democracies, in air quotes for anybody who's listening. Uh, and those countries, those quote democracies, are the ones that are dictating global policy. And they're dictating from afar, from thousands of miles away, you know, the terms and conditions of existence in places like Africa, this, this large, you know, this huge continent of resource rich peoples of all these different diverse you know cultures and peoples and environments and it's like this all over the world that the united states of america and its allies its economic allies and the corporations that ultimately use it as a you know a external structure to you know use the military to get what they want uh, that's really the cause of this it's very clear yeah. it seems we have to add two more elements to this. And one element is the contestation within countries in the global south. So obviously, if you are very rich or have the US government by your side, you can dominate the politics of those countries. You can bring people to power. For example, you want some uh, person, a candidate to win elections in an African country you can certainly with relatively little money ensure that your candidate can vastly outspend somebody who is more devoted to the interests of the local population. So that's another very important thing. The, the way in which you get to exploit the resources without violence in many cases is simply by buying the local government, buying the government of Nigeria, of Congo, whatever it is, and then get them to sign contracts, favorable contracts, where you get to exploit the resources on very favorable terms. They make out like bandits. They get a lot of money that allows them to stay in power indefinitely, to buy themselves support from the army, and so on and so forth. You make a lot of money, but the population is ruled by autocrats and dictators, and the resources disappear. The other element that I think we have to add, totally different element, is the role of the national security obsession. This whole system works because morality is kept out of politics. The system is so obviously unjust, grotesquely unjust, that everybody would notice that very quickly if we didn't have a constant sequence of crises, hostilities, rivalries, right? Now we are building up the Chinese. We have lost the Russians. They turned out to be a little bit of a paper tiger, unfortunately. But now we have the Chinese to worry about. So everybody is talking uh, everywhere in the US about how dangerous the Chinese are. And they're not nice people. They're after us. In the long run, they will displace us. They will, and so on. So we have to be obsessed with our national security, we have to do everything we can in this international competition with the Chinese to prevail, to survive, you know? It's a matter of sheer survival. Which, of and course, that would seem to that, warrant the bypassing of moralities. That's right. So that means that because human rights are so important and because we are the champion of, of human rights and democracy and freedom, we have to leave those very values aside in our struggle with the Chinese because we cannot afford oh, to no. fight the Chinese with one hand tied behind our backs. It's as sad as that. It, it breaks our heart to have to violate human rights, to have to run Guantanamo oh. Bay and things like that. Yeah. It, the drone strikes, you know, we feel it. It's a great sacrifice that we make. We feel very bad about it, but we have to do it. Remember Himmler's speech in, in Poznan, in Poland, you know, when he talked about how sad it was that we have to shoot all these Jewish people. You know, now that you mentioned that, I've never heard, I've, especially on the liberal side, and I am a very gregarious uh, debater. I love talking politics, and I will never miss a chance to do it, even with my old man at dinner table. And I noticed that 
Liberals are masters of cognitive dissonance. I've never heard a liberal, a bleeding heart liberal, talk about how it's uh, unfortunate that they have to do these things. I just get pure denial. I get denial that there is an immorality. I get only, you know, diversions and uh, flipping things to the other side. Oh, well, Russia, when I said, when I just, the, the enemy of, of these people, the bane of their existence seems to be the Wikipedia page of United States regime changes, which is over 70 you know, instances. It has over 70 yeah. entries and it yeah. keeps happening. And they will just will not scroll through it and click on one and read the history or click on another and read the history because every single time there is no moral justification. It is pure resource extraction like Guatemala, a banana company took over that company just to make more money on bananas. Couldn't get any crazier than that. A mad scientist in a comic book could not contrive a more insane supervillain scenario. But they just deny it. They just deny this reality and they say, oh, well, Russia's invaded tons of countries too. And, you know, China, they're an empire as well. And there's this pure cognitive dissonance. And I think that's really what holds the liberal mentality together to get them, to keep them from understanding the true gravity of the situation that we're in today. The conservatives yeah. are just like, oh, yeah, they're bugs. Kill them. And obviously it has to do with our indoctrination and the narrative that we're all fed. And that boils down to the propaganda that the both of you are referring to and all of you said. And uh, and I love that both of you touched on the fact that it's such propaganda and it's and it's, and it's some kind of paradox. Uh, uh, because it brings me back to my motto about politics, is, which is, you know, what started this leg of the discussion when, when you asked uh, our guest that question, what is at the root you feel? Um, and, you know, my motto, Marlo, is... Um, politics or theater that we buy a ticket to with every vote. Um, and of course, that is what leads us into the Stockholm Syndrome state of mind that uh, blinds us from the moralities of what it is we're actually taking part of and uh, participating in by electing people that are there just to uphold status quo and not actually do anything about anything. Well, just a quick um uh, note on that and on this issue of democracy like do we have a global democracy because the vast majority of the people on the planet are not having their needs met and it's clear that they don't have a say in anything that affects them on a daily basis and this is not just true in the third world this is true in the united states as well we haven't even really talked about the relative poverty that people in the united states experience which is ultimately they struggle to meet their basic needs they struggle to be able to afford healthy food the amount of 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 just disease and un, un, unwellness and bad health in the United States is staggering because the food itself doesn't have nutritional value in it to begin with in many cases, no matter how many calories are in it. And so I lost my train of thought there, but uh, oh yeah, inequality. That Another fact that you pointed out in one of your essays uh, was that uh, articles, uh, scholarly academic work. They're not essays. This isn't a sub stack. This is a, this is a serious academic here, peer reviewed, uh, you know, science, social scientific structures that inequality is increasing for 80% of the planet. And so when people talk about poverty is going down and it used to be $2 and 80 cents a day, and now it's $2 and 90 cents a day, you know, even if it jumped up $4, the distance, the gulf between the rich and the poor and the value sorry, the power that those people have is increasing. Can you talk about inequality and the broadening of inequality globally? Yeah, I think the, the inequality thing is it's not just numerical, right? But uh, I gave you the numerical figures. Uh, $59 is the average income in the world. 42% uh, of the world's population cannot afford the $3.54 for a healthy diet. But uh, what makes that inequality really even much more dramatic is the fact that the poor are so incredibly poor. So we have uh, plenty of money in aggregate to wipe out all the poverty in the world very easily. It wouldn't cost much. It would be 3 4 5% of the overall gross social product of the world to eradicate the poverty problem. And that is really the... Uh, most sort of shocking way of expressing this inequality that uh, so many people, 20, 30 percent of the world's population live in affluence, while an even larger number of people are not even able to meet their very most basic needs. So it's a radical inequality and one that also then manifests itself socially uh, in terms of education, for example, access to health care. And it manifests itself, of course, politically, so that 
very large percentages of the human population have no political role whatsoever, not in their own country and certainly not beyond it. They have uh, no capacity to make their voices heard, which of course, again, helps in keeping the rest of us uh, lulled into a sense that things are getting better and things must be all right and so forth. I, I just want to make one point before I think we try to flip over into Amanda's question that we got a little ahead of earlier mm -hmm. about what is the solution to these issues. But I just want to point out that 18 million people dying a year, every single year, uh, all these horrifying statistics, all this horrible data, that's not data, that's human lives. That's every single yes. point in there, every single fraction of a decimal point is a human life that is just crying out in agony, is the, the Grecian tragedy playing out in all of these human lives and the, the mothers that are just racked with pain based on these children that they lose, the, the fear and the scarcity and the pain and the anxiety of not having enough, of never having enough, of not knowing what the hell is going to go on, is going to happen to you, of being powerless, of even relative poverty in America is unfucking acceptable. I have experienced it. I grew up fairly privileged and wealthy and through a, ser a combination of choices and just raw, raw, raw dog mental illness, have been homeless, have been extremely poor, always struggled to meet my basic needs. And so I understand what poverty is on a cellular level and it is ghastly. It is something I would not wish on my worst enemy. It robs you of your ability to think critically. It just steals your life from you. It steals your future, your past. You live in this this permanent scream of agony that is the moment. And not in the moment of like Buddhism of like, there's only now, like the moment of like, oh, this moment is eternal. And then, oh, another moment. And then, oh, another moment. And another thing I have to do. And I just want to say, just, just sharp, sharp as I can, that to me, this is a form of violence of, of murder on mass levels. It is a genocide, the likes of which that has been unparalleled in human history. And I think it is a, a structural systemic failure and a byproduct of the market, that it is the pure failure of the market mechanism that rules every single interaction in our world. We can call ourselves democracies, but we're not. We are a market society. We are a slave society. And the market's failure to allocate resources effectively and efficiently to those people is a form of mass murder. Yes. No just... Yes. Thank you. That was gorgeous. I have nothing more to say. We could wrap it up and I'd be happy. <laughs> uh, but no, in well, all seriousness, it's, it's, it's that sad. Yeah. It's that real. Um, and I love that you point out that this data is representing real lives, real suffering. You know, that's another point of dissonance uh, that we all engage in, unfortunately, and it's, it's somewhat necessary. You know, uh, Thomas's work here, you know, lots of data, lots of statistics, lots of studies, and it all gets uh, reduced down to numbers, to, you know, and, and we forget that the lives and the suffering behind them are why we're doing this. And, and it can become an out of sight, out of mind thing, which, of course, you know, builds up apathy um, and we are going to get into the solutions part of this but if I could ask Thomas and if this derails things maybe we could talk about it another time but I personally am very curious as to how you got um, interested in this line of work in this field of study what brought you to be so um, uh, engaged with you know the the origins and functions of poverty um and, and led you to do all of these studies because me personally it's stuff this stuff jumps out at me just through my day-to-day -day mundane life i find myself uh doing studies of sorts in my mind or, or, you know, collecting data and making spreadsheets and writing articles and things. Um, and I, and I just sometimes feel like who else is paying attention? Who even cares about these things? Why am I taking down these numbers? And then I'm refreshed when I encounter people like you who have an aim with all of that uh, material. So, so what brought you around to doing this field of work? So I think uh, there were, if you, Ask sort of an autobiographical question. There are two uh, events that uh, got me into this. The first event was around age eight when I learned about the Holocaust. Mm -hmm. And uh, I grew up in Germany and uh, nobody had talked about it. And I, I don't remember even how I found out about it, but I became, you know, I walked around and asked everybody about it and studied about it and so on. I was a little precocious so I could read quite a lot and uh, it was just stunning to me. Uh, you know, you grew up as a child, uh, you said the world is pretty normal, everything is nice, people are nice, everything is in good order 
And then you hear that uh, just 20 years earlier, there was this horrible thing that happened here. And that pretty much everybody you know, all these nice neighbors and so on, where your parents potentially were involved in this, uh, participating in it and so on. And I basically got completely lost my sense of uh, trust and authority. Absolutely. I thought, you know, you cannot trust anything the adults tell you. You have to completely start from scratch and work it all out for yourself. And then another thing that was really important for me was during graduate school, I spent a summer traveling through Asia. I'd uh, been to North America, I'd been to Europe, but not anywhere else. And uh, that was a three-month trip, sort of a bit like uh, Marlo now, sort of hippieing around. I had no money. I was just sort of, you know, taking buses and uh, trains and hitchhiking and so forth and getting across Asia all the way from the western to the eastern end. And uh, I encountered poverty. So I saw Delhi, for example. Uh, I arrived there. I saw people were selling bananas on the street. They uh, ate bananas for a rupee. uh, And you got eight rupees for a dollar at that time. Mm -hmm. So you got 64 Mm -hmm. bananas for a dollar. Wow. And people were clearly malnourished. They couldn't afford uh, to buy bananas. So for a while, I just spent what money I had on buying bananas and handing them out to kids. Uh-huh. Uh, and, you know, because I thought they're so cheap, but of course, I, there were many more kids than I could buy bananas. And yeah. I, it was just inconceivable to me that people were that poor. And then uh, I came to Calcutta and uh, saw a slum there, and people were infinitely poorer than the poorest people in Delhi. People were living in housing that looked like a dog hut. You know, when in Germany, people have these little wooden sheds where the dog lives. And that is where people lived. Uh, And it wasn't even wood. It was cardboard. It was corrugated iron with sort of scraps and garbage from which they had built little shelters that no doubt with any kind of serious rain or wind would collapse. The poverty was just unthinkable. It's no longer there in that extreme case but uh, even today in india you can find tremendous poverty of course in africa even more so so uh, just the experience and I, I said once i had seen that i said you have to do this is something that uh, you have to devote your life to you can't just sort of ignore this this is too important to you know what what else can possibly matter compared to that oh wow and Course, even then I had a very clear sense that this was entirely avoidable, that the world was productive enough, and especially that you could make these people much more productive, right? Mm-hmm. They, you wouldn't even have to do it for them. You, all you would have to do is unleash their own capacities, give them a little education, give them a little capital, and they would be plenty capable of uh, you know, maintaining a pretty serious standard of living like we have in Europe and North America and so on. It sounds like um, across that timeline, you pretty expediently come to the conclusion on your own, uh, you know, uh, how unnecessary poverty is. And I love that you point out the fact that if you, as you said, unleash people's capacity, and I I would frame it as unleash the resources people need to live up to their full potential that they can contribute to society and these places won't be so impoverished. And that is another uh, essential point to make when you're trying to help people understand the mechanisms of poverty and why we have to overcome it. And one way to do that is to just give people access to their basic needs so that they can contribute to society and make society a place that is not impoverished. But also, I just want to note that it sounds like in your childhood, uh, learning that, you know, you, 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 just couldn't take things uh, that were said to you for granted that you had to get to the bottom of it yourself definitely and quickly manifested in your travels after seeing how abundant the world is but yet how poor people are yeah i just want to reflect on that that uh i just deeply relate to that and that's that's like the the origin story i was writing today and i wrote that like all uh heroes and people fighting for a better world have an origin story that is you know deeply tragic and uh, and uh, all villains don't need an origin story. They get paid to be villains. <laughs> oh, 
good one. <laughs> but uh, I just relate to that in that I've traveled this world and I've been outside beyond my backyard and been outside the uh, mm-hmm. infrastructure of Western countries and the, the, uh, the fall line of, uh, of propaganda that keeps things keeps the narrative in place that keeps people thinking that everything is fine and that it, it's improving and that we're exporting our our quality of life to people and help helping them civilize themselves from their barbaric natural impoverished place but gdp is up actually, and see for yourself just how false that is and it's very strange and very deep that i'm i'm with a lot of uh expatriates here in colombia and they see it every fucking day they ride past it on their motorcycles and yet they still can reconcile to themselves that this is somehow these people's fault. They're not industrious. You know, they chose this. They're just not productive enough. Maybe if they were, someone had the gall to say <laughs> that the third world just hasn't uh, been useful for capitalism, that it hasn't, hasn't uh, been useful for the market. And it's like, are you kidding me? The third That's world. That's why they're third world countries. Well, it exists because they came here with guns and cannons and took what they had. You know, I just, uh, yeah, I just, yes. I just, in, in a mode of appreciation and not more negativity, I think that it is an adventure to solve great problems and to, to travel the world and see the problems for yourself. That's how you find this is what I must do. There is only one thing to do. There is no other alternative for me to devote my life to something that is bigger than I am. And I think that that adventure of, of, saving the world of solving these problems of revolution of of evolution of change that this is why we exist and to bring those people who can't afford anything they cannot afford a life out of that and just give them the very basics that's all people need they're so curious we have such intrinsic motivation and drive to succeed and to explore and to innovate and evolve that if you just give people the fucking very basics we would see collectively Mr. Bill Gates and his innovation fetish would be blown away by how much innovation we would see yes. if we just gave the people of the world the very basics to just live their own lives, to explore, to access the incredible well of knowledge that you know sits in this crazy dark crystal glowing orb of rare earth minerals that allows me access to all the knowledge in the world. But it's just you need so little truly to really excel and be a, a member of the human race. Okay. I was going to say Go stress ahead. kills brain cells. You're talking about the fact that we can't innovate because we're always in fight or flight. We're always in crisis. We're always fighting to survive. And it's unfathomable to me because here we are in 2023 and we're supposed to be living in a civilization and all these centuries of progress were supposed to have taken place so that we can live in leisure and luxury. But yet it's gate kept to this many people, you know, and so you have a Bill Gates who is the only person that's allowed to innovate, apparently. Or even not even just live in luxury, but just to live, just to be able to meet basic needs. I think a society that allows even one person, five people, 10 people, 100 people to live in poverty and die because they don't have water to drink or they're they're shitting themselves to death. They're struggling with medieval diseases that are long curable that you could cure for pennies literally pennies to manufacture the medicines the generic medicines of ideas that human beings develop that i that we, we shouldn't be charging money for forever so I, I i just want to sort of flip over here to get into the kind of the last leg of our show and i think we could absolutely do a, another whole episode on just a super deep dive on the the all the data and all the information and all the solutions on how to fix this but thomas just last leg of the journey thinking about being that young man you know reading about the holocaust and the suffering in the world and seeing it and buying kids bananas you know what is the mass equivalent of that how do we come together how could we as a society if we gave a shit about human life end this problem yeah so uh, this is a, a very difficult question for two reasons right we what we want to do is we want to find alternative ways of structuring the world and not only that but ones that we could actually reach from where we are so the very difficult problem is the problem of transition how can we get the ball rolling how can we given the overwhelming strength of the forces arrayed against us effect meaningful structural change change that lasts change that brings further changes within reach 
And here, you know, I've thought about this a lot and come up with various kinds of ideas. But the idea that I think is the most promising is an idea that, contrary to what you said earlier, preserves to some extent the idea of markets, but shows that markets can be structured very differently. And so my favorite uh, boo-boo men are intellectual property rights in the sense of patents, that you give people a monopoly and you allow them to veto the use of something important for everybody else. What I think we should do instead is to incentivize innovation in a different way by saying that if you invent something useful, you will be paid in proportion to how useful it is, how much benefit it bestows on other people. And so in the pharmaceutical sphere, for example, that would mean that the more people's health you improve, and by the more you improve it with your medicine, the more money you make. This would be still a kind of market system. You would have an artificial market where the innovators of medicines would compete with each other for a fixed sum of money given out each year as a reward for achieving health gains. But it would be a market where the incentives would be completely reversed. So instead of having pharmaceutical companies scour the world like jealous husbands to see, is there anybody who's using my molecule without my permission? You would have pharmaceutical companies going around the world saying, please use my molecule. Yeah. Because if you use Imagine my molecule, that. and if you help people with my molecule, I will show you how to do it. I help you. I don't charge you anything. I'm at your service. I will show you the technology. I will show you how to make it. Please use my molecule and use it to improve people's health because that is what's going to make me money. We could have a system where pharmaceutical companies would make as much money as they make now. And at the same time, these medicines that they invent, instead of reaching 10 or 15 or 20 percent of the world's population, would reach into the far reaches of the earth and we would have infectious diseases eradicated. Rather than confining our treatments to 20 percent and letting the other 80 percent proliferate the disease, we would actually contain and suppress the disease and eradicate it pretty quickly insofar as we are talking about infectious diseases, which are still the bane of the existence of, of poor populations, as you mentioned with the diarrhea example. So a uh, question, um, you, you said there's an artificial market that is created. So where does the money come from this? Is this does this come through governments? It would, yeah, it would be, uh, it could be come from anywhere in principle, but uh, initially, let's say it would be governments and taxpayers would through the tax system, fund these annual disbursements, but they would also save a lot of money in terms of cheaper medicines, right? Instead of paying thousands of dollars for your medicine, you would pay pennies for your medicine. As you said rightly, uh, generic drugs are very cheap, can be manufactured very, very cheaply. And of course, the same is true for patented drugs. They can be manufactured very, very cheaply. So let them be manufactured very cheaply let them be sold at very low prices and let the rich people who now pay for research and development through the monopoly markups in the patent phase of the medicine, let them pay through the tax system instead. So rich people would pay for the research and development of new medicines, but they would do so without excluding everybody else from their use, which is what is now happening, where people get to use the medicine only after the 20 year patent period has expired, often it's evergreened and lasts even longer. When you talk about access to medicine, you're obviously talking about keeping people well, healthy. The thing that comes to mind for me is public health. And then I recall an episode that we did with woke scientists on Instagram, and it was titled A Profoundly Sick Society. And in that episode, she talked a lot about how we live in a sick society because of our lack of access to basic needs and how that impoverishes society, as I was saying before. And in all that you said there, it sounds like um, to, to boil it down, 
to give people access to their basic needs is to make society a healthy place to be. You go from having social poverty to social wealth and subsequent health. Um, so I kind of lost my train of thought there, but it was uh, it was good. I was getting somewhere. Um, but what I, I guess what I'm trying to say is if you agree with that, um, what if you have tried to envision this society, does that look like, what is the vision in your head, a society that is robust, resilient, and actually healthy, and not so profoundly sick, as a result of people being able to access medicine because scientists and pharmaceuticals aren't withholding molecules and patents and whatnot, but also because you know, clean water, healthy food, adequate shelter is accessible. What does that society look like for you? Because that's the vision that's all motivating us right now, but we all have a different, um, you know, version of it. You have certainly added a very important component to this thing. Uh, so we are achieving a healthy society, not by having everybody having the medicines that they, uh, that cure their uh, ailments, but first and foremost, by attending to the social determinants of health. Right. 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 We need medicines to cure things like malaria and so on. There are tuberculosis, uh, pneumonia, schistosomiasis, and so on. There are lots of diseases that we really need medicines for. But a very large part of the global disease burden is simply the unhealthy lifestyles that we have pesticides, fertilizers, and so on. Our, you know, the, the forever plastics that we are breathing in. I'm, I've just lived through two or three weeks of wildfire smoke here mm. in New Haven, where the Canadian wildfires brought us enormous amounts of PM 2.5. Yeah. So that is uh, the the bigger part of health. You're completely right about this. I was just giving an example of how, if you overturn the intellectual property system how you could make already an enormous progress. The, the thing that I said earlier on at the, near the beginning is that uh, rich people, people who are richer than others for whatever reason, often historical reasons having to do with colonialism and so on, rich people always try to entrench their advantage, right? I have money, I have power, and I want to keep it. I want to somehow build a wall around myself, protect myself, make sure that other people are not catching up. And you do that in finance, you do that in military technologies, you do that in politics and so on. And intellectual property rights are one mechanism, one very important mechanism in our world, uh, how people remain rich, right? So Bill Gates, to go back to that example, He's got this word processing program called Word. He's got Excel spreadsheets. These are not rocket science. This is pretty simple, idiotic stuff. Mm. He makes a lot of money out of this because this is what everybody's using, right? And so if I want to send an article to a publisher, I better send it in Microsoft Word or in some one of mm. his uh, sort of things because that is what the publisher is expecting. Not and to so mention government contracts that they're all in schools. Yeah, so because he got there first, he's basically become the standard and right. he can charge everybody a large fee for using his software. It's a monopoly. Yeah, it's a monopoly, essentially. It's a monopoly that's not even based on any kind of brilliance or even remotely brilliance. It's based on the fact that it's become the, common, the commonly used thing. It's the lingua franca of files, you know, the files that get bopped around the universe. So uh, it is what I'm saying. It is one way sort of to entrench yourself. You entrench yourself with capital because then you can lend money to other people. You can collect interest and you can keep those people poor because they have a constant headwind of having to pay you interest and you yourself can expand your advantage over others by having a constant income that comes in. Uh, land owning for much of human history was that sort of thing, that you owned the land. And if I wanted to live, if I wanted to plant and harvest and eat, I had to give you half of my harvest because after all, you were the landowner. Right. 
Right. Well, I love that I struck a chord with you and you took the time to expound on that topic, but I'm still curious what that society looks like to you. What What does that healthy, uh, vibrant society look like in your head? How, I mean, I have set and tried to wrap my head around the contrast of what we have now and what it could be like. And it's hard to perceive, but nonetheless exciting to try and, you know, pull out of the yeah. abyss. <laughs> Uh, if, if you want something that is reasonably realistic, I mean, the best realistic glimpse that we have of what such a world could look like is the best organized societies that we have in the world today. They are not perfect by any stretch. But if you go to a society, I'm Denmark, New Zealand, I don't know, even Canada, if you go to these societies, they have their problems, uh, but uh, some of these problems, of course, are due to the fact that they are operating within a much larger world that is right. very imperfect, to put it mildly. But these societies work reasonably well. That is, I mean, if the world were Denmark or Sweden or something like that, uh, the 95% of the problem would be gone, right? Nobody would be in severe poverty. There would be social services. There would be good education for children so that poverty of parents wouldn't be visited upon the children and so on, you would have a much, much better world. And we could easily, we have the wherewithal, we have the capacities, the administrative, economic, technological, scientific wherewithal to run the whole world roughly like the most advanced nation states are now run. I just want to uh, backtrack a little bit and, and sort of pick into um, the sort of market solution to these mm -hmm. problems. And I, I kind of want to bring a couple of things together here um, because this, this issue is so big and it's so interconnected and it's just compounded by every other issue like climate change, which is going to increase poverty just beyond anything we can even fathom. And all of these issues are compounding exponentially. And the root issue, which we digged into a little bit earlier, there is inequality. So even if there was a way f to create this sort of artificial market where uh, government funds are distributed to pharmaceutical companies so they can continue to be as wealthy as they are. I think that's kind of the cause of poverty is the fact that the distribution of wealth is so great that our political system is completely run through and bought and sold by those who have so much money they can buy the governments of other countries and to say nothing of the, the media and the idea space and the political mechanisms of their own countries. So countries like Denmark Sweden, for example, is one of the largest manufacturers of weapons in the world. Um, all of these countries sort of exist on the low wages and the structurally beneficially to the global system we have today, impoverishment of the rest of the world. That if I would say there is a, you know, there's a, there's a global minimum wage of even like $7 an hour, whole market is just crashed. There's not going to be, I, I could imagine there's not a single profitable company left on the planet earth if there was even a small attempt at, at increasing the quality of life globally so ultimately the problem is inequality the problem is ramped up and intensified by the sort of financial systems you described earlier and i just think ultimately as all these problems converge the reality is that the rich own the world the people have no say in what what gets done even academics like yourself who have so much data are marginalized in terms of actual policy making. And I think it comes down to, I don't really know what this word means to all people, it, 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 but it comes down to some sort of revolutionary change where there is a serious change of the people coming together and saying, this simply will not do because we're not gonna see change through these political mechanisms that are so bought and sold that, that all reform, even the most mild, even the most basic, even the most common sense reforms are fought tooth and nail. Any change is taught, fought tooth and nail because the whole political system exists to, to maintain the existing system. So that's my perspective is that I'm open to any change that will increase or decrease the deaths that are happening pointlessly around the world. Any change that's going to put more bananas in the hands of more children, I'm for. But ultimately, I just I believe we have to be very cynical about these reformist sorts of ways of change because we have to go through a political system that we do not control. Yeah, I, I see your point, and I, I still sort of, I mean, it's, it's a difficult judgment to make, but I think that I come to the opposite conclusion to yours. So I come to the conclusion that 
we need to make small changes to strengthen people, uh, poor people, poor populations, uh, to make them more effective in helping us to change. We, are, we don't have the strength to make any kind of world revolution, abolishing markets, anything of that sort. It, it's just not going to happen. What we can do is fight in the interstices and fight uh, where we have, you know, the the problem, the big problem to speak about political movements in my generation, my generation has been a total washer, total failure, has achieved nothing. <laughs> and the reason why we have achieved so little is because we have been, you know, thinking of progressive movements as a recreational activity. Mm. Yes. And we have been very devoted to being creative. You don't want to use uh, join somebody else's movement. You want to have your own ideas, your own movement, be your own person. Yep. Exactly. And so, uh, and Usually. it has to have recreational value. People didn't take it seriously, and the other side was bloody serious. The other side was basically very goal oriented very scientific in the way they ran their propaganda machines, in the way they exerted their political influence. So while they were really well organized and took over the world bit by bit, including the Supreme Court, including uh, the institutions, political institutions and so on, we have basically had a good time. Uh, feeling good about ourselves, that we care, but not really accomplishing anything. So what we need to do is find those few levers where we can, even weakened as we are now, where we can exert influence and strengthen the people whom we need as allies, which are the world's poor. They are natural allies, and they would be much better able to help us change the world if they weren't so completely overwhelmed with the task of living hand to mouth day to day, which you described very well. So, and here again, uh, you look at, you know, the, the reform that I was outlining just for pharmaceuticals. You say, well, this doesn't really fundamentally change anything. Pharmaceutical companies remain rich. You're completely right. That is true. But you know how many families fall into poverty each week because they have special medical bills. Grandpa gets sick. Child gets sick. You feel absolutely committed. You have to move heaven and earth to get the medication for your family member. So you borrow money from your friends and you know do what you can. And uh, it will take you years to pay back. There will be sacrifices. Kid can't go to school because we had to save grandpa from the disease, you know? And so if we could get this relatively small thing changed and make sure that good medicine is available for people it would be a big step in the right direction. Of course, it's not the only step we should take, but we should focus on a few such reforms that can shift the balance in our favor and focus on them full force and try to get those things changed. That don't seem terribly threatening uh, and so won't get the entire army of capitalist defenders mobilized against us. Ah, because that's just an impediment to to our you know objective. Yeah, I just want to say that I agree with all of that, and I, I I love your point about how unserious progressive you know or radical activist movements are. You know, it's a big it's a big vanity project for a lot of people that they can feel like they're helping, but they they're not serious people, and they're doing it on the weekend, and they themselves are still subjugated to the same drive to make money, to work for the system, that they are ultimately limited in what they can accomplish. And so I think that we, we I don't think we disagree. I think we maybe disagree, I don't know. I, I think, I think we, just, we all need to spend more time finding the complementarity and the cooperativity of our ideas and belief systems. And we're all coming to this from different The big question that you're raising is the question, what is the next step? Where do we start this, mm -hmm. right? And uh, here the, there is this bit, bit of a contrast. Do we start relatively small in a way that a lot of people who are on the other side can live with and maybe even support? Or do we confront the system head on and uh, basically 
challenge them to a fight to the finish. And well, I, I don't agree with the second. I don't agree with the second. Actually, I think we are more in alignment than yeah. So essentially, I feel like the answer to that question is, if we could tap even one percent of all the the foppish, you know, ineffectual funds and NGOs and donations that go to very superficial ways to treat poverty and use them to create yes. conditions for self-sustaining habitats for people to, to invest in mm. permanent infrastructure for these people, even on a small basic level of creating permaculture in communities. You were talking earlier about the ideal societies. I was thinking about Kerala in India, which is a rare place mm. that is run very cooperatively in a very community, communal way that has a very organic practices. The people are very healthy. Food is very cheap. That if we can work on this hyper local level in an interconnected way, basically mm. taking the I mean, the amount of money that it takes to completely transform the lives of people in dire poverty is just so much less than you think it is. Yeah. Listener, dear listener, it costs nothing to literally end slavery. I did a, an amazing interview with uh, Kevin Bales, an expert in slavery, and he was saying that it's like hundreds of dollars to just forever change the life of someone living in poverty. And I think instead of thinking about things in an individualized way, I think we in the global north, we in the high income countries and globally, because as you said, these are our, our compatriots. These are our brothers and sisters. Not only should we care about them, but there are great allies in building dual power and building a parallel system, which is what we're really about here. That's our solution. It isn't Everybody get together and yell. Everybody get together and flip cars over. That's not going to fucking help anything. We've seen that for, for decades. What will help and what has helped in the past is to be, be constructive in creating liberatory structures and in re-empowering the people to make the decisions about their own communities. I mean, I look at the peoples of, of the Zapatistas of Chiapas, Mexico, and they, they changed their lives. They created a revolution that... They did stand up to the power structures, but they did it by meeting their own needs. They did it because they weren't dependent on that system. And so if we can create the structures in the developed world and in the undeveloped world, which is way ripe for that because it's way cheaper, because it's way less, uh, you know, in industrialized, you know, rents are less, you know, the cost of everything is much lower. And so if we can create this cooperativity between the peoples of the world and create structures, living structures that aren't just trying to meet the symptoms of poverty, but that create habitats that sustain us permanently, we can end this and we can build power and we can show that there's an alternative. And there's just, it, it's, a, it's a feedback loop that reciprocates itself and creates a, a reaction that is greater than the sum of its parts. The word model has to be in there. That is... Uh, I mean, it's implicit, but it uh, it's good to make it explicit. Uh, we have to build models, models of how communities can be structured and how they can be self-sustaining, how things could be organized differently. And that can be done on the local level, and it can also be done uh, in on a sectoral level that you, for example, you make that change about intellectual property rights in pharmaceuticals. You know, if some model like that could work, you, people would say, why in the world are we paying all this money to Microsoft? You know? and so the whole intellectual property system would uh, then become highly questionable in the minds of people. So we need good models and we can achieve them by focusing political energy. And that's been a, a very big defect, the lack of focus, doing a little bit of everything. Who, who is developing models that you know of? And, and what models exist out there that are all true alternatives? Yeah, so uh, the I think a, a number of people are developing models whom I know of, uh, small models. I know uh, one in Costa Rica, for example. Uh, I'm uh, heading a little organization called Academic Stand Against Poverty. And one thing we are doing is uh, AGAPE, which is AMBETCA grants for eradicating, uh, for advancing poverty eradication, that's it. And so we give small grants to people in India who have good ideas about how to eradicate poverty, local ideas, uh, grants in the amount of somewhere around $2,000, which is a lot of money in poor communities in India. And uh, we try out new ways, you know, connecting uh, people, uh, creating local worker communities and so on. It's, uh, you know, on a very small scale, but it... Uh, is, I think, an interesting way forward to see whether poor people themselves 
can come up with ideas for how they can alleviate their poverty, how they can overcome it, how they can work their way out of it within a highly hostile, larger context in which they exist. It's enthralling and absolutely exciting to learn that you yourself are involved in the hands-on work and trying to eradicate poverty. Like you went beyond doing the legwork of uh, this this dense body of work that you've put together throughout your career about poverty, and you're actually trying to alleviate it. So hats off to you for that. But um, I'm I'm especially interested because, um, like you all are talking about, starting on a local level, um, I too see it see the solution through that lens. We've got to um, empower people before we can coalesce as a critical mass to make any kind of uh, social paradigm change, right? Um, And so um, here in my little town in the Appalachia, I too am um, uh, heading an initiative where we are trying to reorient uh, Appalachians with the concept of community through the lens of mutual aid. Uh, Because, you know, again, with, as you said, helping people to understand how they can make an impact in their own community, but also in their own lives just by uh, using the prerogatives that they may not know they even have. Um, I, I would have to debate with you on whether or not, uh, you know, channeling your energy into political reform would be uh, as useful as the grassroots movement, like what I'm working on and what it sounds like you're working on, getting people just to take action on their interpersonal level for themselves and for their community. Because what I'm learning and what a lot of people in my little community are learning is there are so many things we can do to lift each other up out of poverty that don't even require permission because people are uh, tend to be so uneducated when it comes to politics and the laws we assume there's so many things that we can't even do without asking first but I'm learning um, and being delighted uh, to find that there are a lot of things we can't actually do for each other an example would be and again it sounds trivial it sounds so small like a drop in the bucket but it's going to build resilience within this community of people who are suffering from poverty and that's we're going to put up a handful of dry pantries, the, the like street side uh, library, uh, free libraries, but food. Um, and you know, that's going to require some management that's going to require some dedication and commitment from some community people. But it's also going to provide multiple access points to food and ideally nutritious food and even better locally grown food because we have been able to form a coalition of sorts of local urban farmers so that we can start depending less on the big box stores and more on each other and local food supply chains. And again, starting on the micro level, you're able to build your way up to make an impact on uh, a level that actually starts to change the feedback loop. All right. So, for example, you could publish a book about this experience or make a video about it and then help other communities similarly situated to to do something similar. Absolutely. I am documenting it thoroughly. So hopefully it can become a a replicable, scalable template. We need to to work uh, at all levels. I agree with that completely. We have to work at the very local level and we also have to think about the very big global structures. Mm -hmm. But we have to work together, and that is what we have done too little of. You know, the yeah. that we have to think about the whole enchilada, rather than each one working in their own little cubbyhole and uh, without coordination and even without understanding of one another. Absolutely, yeah. That that that's the main um, concept of the Appalachian Community Mill and Pro- uh, Mutual Aid Project is helping people to. Um, feel comfortable again with knowing their neighbors. Uh, Our slogan is come have dinner with your neighbors. It's a free meal and anyone's welcome. And what happens is strangers sit across the table from each other and share a free meal that is nutritious, locally provided and, and prepared with hands that genuinely care about whether or not they are fed well Uh, and these strangers leave as acquaintances and sometimes develop friendships and from there develop networks of mutual aid and support within the community so that their you know resilience is built that is like the main objective Amanda we got to make a commercial of you saying all that like uh, you know in the super appellation like like a uh, apron, <laughs> like with the cast iron skillet. The I've got bread, a few of those. The logo, 
You're so good. You're such a doll. Excellent, excellent. Tell me where, well, where thank it you is. for saying so. I'm coming. Yeah, it sounds delicious. Like I'm hungry. Please listening. visit. We would just I'm love hungry. to host not you both. Justice. I'm not just hungry for the eradication of poverty. I'm hungry for some good old southern collard greens and biscuits. See, that's the beauty of it. You get the culture, but only the good parts. Um, no, uh, that that sounded bad. But um, we're in Berea, Kentucky. Uh, And it happens to be a town that already was laying stones of foundation for sustainability and community. So I have to say I had a leg up when I moved here and started this project. However, um, you know, it needed a little reviving. And uh, pleasantly, I've been encountered by several people who say that they are grateful to see a new initiative in town because they were getting tired of old white money, as they put it, bureaucracy and processes and resources being centralized. And myself and my group of volunteers are here to break that up and, again, just reorient people with what it is to live in a communal sense because that's where... Uh, resilience is that's how resilience is bred that's how we reach any level of efficacy um is through uh remembering that we're interconnected yeah i think that the that one of the last things you just said thomas is that you're working with people to in uh, amazing mind-blowing idea get the poor people themselves to help figure out how to end their own poverty you know to that's that's just so crazy i spent years like working and crusading in the fight to end homelessness and to protect the rights and the lives of homeless people in Los Angeles and other places. And it was just this, even for me, for me at one point was like a revelation, like, Whoa, nobody's asking these people how to solve their own problems. All these well-meaning people and academics and activists are literally giving speeches and they've never once just turned around to the person next to them and been like, Hey, what would help you? What would help you? We did a fantastic episode, one of our first ever episodes uh, about a community that was created in in Echo Park in Los Angeles in the belly of the beast. And they created this thriving, beautiful community. I actually lived there in my van while it was existent. And they created this beautiful community where everyone supported each other and they had donations from the street or from people in, in the houses. And they uh, eventually eliminated money and they, they just they created a beautiful s- s- thriving little ecosystem of people supporting each other and people supporting people and solidarity between those who have and those who have not. And I just think that is ultimately the model that we need to create everywhere. We need to create self-sustaining, interconnected communities. And we will be working on developing our own models for a business model and a plan, ultimately to create a sort of hybrid money-less system where people work together cooperatively, where they don't require money for the basic needs of life. They are not trading pieces of paper with each other to meet their basic needs. We are not creating a system that mathematically generates inequality between peoples. It is about solidarity. It is about a shared wealth and prosperity. It is about giving people what they need to work together and erasing these bullshit differences that separate us this this false sense of of identifying and and saying who i am based on i have better stuff than you and i'm more developed than you how fucking arrogant is that how ignorant is that i personally i personally cannot stand living in the first world i cannot stand living in those nice countries where trust between peoples is so low and and uh, people don't dance or sing or share meals or they don't brush elbows with each other on the bus. I, would, I choose to spend my time among the poor of the world because they haven't forgotten how to live. They, are, mm. they may be poor in money, but in a place like Colombia that is so rich in music and vibrancy and smiles and quality of life and experience and the fucking delicious fruits and ecosystems and biodiversity, like they are so rich. And all the places in the world that are the most poor are just the least, they just have the least money. They're the richest places. They're the places you want to go. You don't want to live in dreary England or Denmark or Norway or any of these. You know, I'm sure those places are beautiful. I'm sure there's beauty everywhere. But really, we know that the true wealth and the richness of the world does not come from how much money you have. And so that underlies the fundamental absurdity of saying these people have $2 a day and they can basically meet their needs. They have just enough calories to not die. And therefore, and they working. are not yeah. So on that note, Thomas, I think we're at our time here. Um, in the spirit of creating a richer world for all, in the spirit of eradicating poverty, we would love to have you on the show again. We would love Please. to go deeper into many solutions. And I am personally am very skeptical of 
of solutions. And I, I, it's more about a go further kind of thing. It's more about let's create a system of solutions. Let's actually do as you're saying and work together with academics and with Appalachian cooks and with poor children in India and Africa and all over the world. Like let's work together and create a model. Let's design a society. Let's cooperate together more and more and more until we have a new system. Otherwise we are, we're just so poor. You got any closing statements, any closing insights? Actually, one more question for you, if that's okay. And if maybe you can weave that into your last one, because this is like the personal question. This is the heart that I have. How do you emotionally deal with what you know, with understanding the gravity of not just knowing all that's these fucking question. statistics, knowing what each one means? How do you not blow up in the faces of people who would deny what you're talking about? How do you stay sane? in this world of such unbelievable iniquity and, and not in constant rage because that's something i have to like suppress all the time yeah so again that is very difficult to answer because one often doesn't have a very deep insight into one's own psychology but basically i i think i just wall it off i've become quite thick-skinned about this i feel it but uh, in a somewhat more distant way because you know, I'm in work mode. That's basically it. So I feel like somebody feels maybe in a in an emergency. Let's say you are an emergency room doctor or something, and you mechanically go through the, you know, you concentrate, you focus your forces on the problem. You do what you can in a given day and uh, try not to get derailed by too much emotion so it's like you, you you obviously are walking some type of balance where you uh have one foot on the side of realizing and remembering why you're doing the work the importance and the feelings oh, yeah. behind it and the other foot is on the side of you know being methodical doing the research you know going through the motions so that the work gets yeah. done without your emotions thwarting work that progress and that you yeah and you you have to you know in, in my life at least you have to uh very often you have to debate people on the other side mm. right you have to deal with economists at the world bank for example you know for the <laughs> decades long battle over <laughs> these numbers and the battle is not won by some emotional story about uh, what it is really like to be poor. The battle is won by saying, you don't understand shit about mathematics. You have made <laughs> glaring mistakes. <laughs> right? And then when somebody comes to me and says, look, you are just a philosopher. I, as an economist, have to tell you that everything you're saying is bullshit. I say, okay, let's debate the economics here. Mm -hmm. Right? Really beat them at their own game that was crucially important yes in this in this thing you just sort of take the rug out from under them and take away the legitimacy of this you know the, their mathematics is third rate you know at the very best it's not particularly sophisticated but they managed to slip an integral into their essay and they think that they are doing something really truly sophisticated and it isn't you know the the whole ppp uh, enterprise purchasing power parity enterprise is just bullshit and you can point that out and you can deflate it and in order to do that you really have to be highly analytic mm. and totally professional because otherwise you will uh, not be taken seriously you'll be a kind of decoration at conferences who gets invited as the person who tells the sob story from the third world or something like that i want to see you get into the ring with it Economist, badly. Is that on YouTube anywhere? The uh, it's there's a whole volume about it. You know, I uh, did with an, uh, a young economist, an Indian economist. We did a critique of the World Bank's poverty numbers. Really devastating critique. And then the, down. the chief economist <laughs> of the World Bank, uh, Joseph Stiglitz, who this was before he had his Nobel Prize. Uh, he said, oh, my God, you know, what is this? And uh, he said, oh, we will take care of this. We will do a big conference and we will do a book about this and so on. And then he delayed it and delayed it and delayed it. And then he found himself some economists who were saying that the World Bank numbers were much too pessimistic. Uh, a clown. 
uh, and so he had <laughs> found a party audience, clown that, that could produce the numbers yeah, that they need. Conference where the World Bank was in the middle between me and <laughs> one extreme people who were saying the World Bank numbers are understating poverty dramatically, and then the clown saying that the World Bank is uh, has overlooked the fact that there are no poor people anymore. Poverty has already disappeared. Oh, wow. So, That's great. Hey, you did it. Well, congratulations. at its best. Another uh, Nobel Prize for you. Yeah. Uh, it was just extremely funny. But the book came out about 10 years after we launched the critique. And, of course, the critique uh, was went around the world, you know, a lot and a lot of people uh, saw it in mimeograph and various sort of unpublished versions, but the publication, they managed to delay, delay, delay. Anyway, that is uh, really interesting and amusing stuff about how these poverty numbers get cooked up and how the hunger numbers got cooked up. I wrote a whole essay about the hunger numbers, you know, the under The hunger games? And the Hunger Games, exactly. Uh, the Hunger Games. Of all of your works, essays, articles, books, um, where would you suggest someone start? For our listeners who may be enthralled as I am and want to dig in, um, you know, like like the excerpt that Marlo read at the beginning, uh, which is just again so beyond inspiring. Um, where where would you suggest people start with your writings, and how can we access them? Mm-hmm. So, uh, I mean, access, uh, everything is, so, a lot of it is open access and you can download it. I can send it to you. That's the easy part. Wonderful. So I think two pieces that I like that are reasonably accessible. Uh, one is called, Are We Violating the Rights of the Global Poor? And the other is called, Assisting, in scare quotes, the Global Poor. So those are two mm. pieces that are reasonably accessible and that tell the the big story with which Marlowe started, namely the story that these people did, you know, are not in poverty under their own steam. These people are systematically kept in poverty, and we are doing yes. it to them. Yes, that is the point. I uh, sort of somewhat technically, I talk about negative duties. Negative duties are duties not to do certain things, not to harm people, and we are violating negative duties. This is in the anglophone context, right, where people say, look, I, of course, I mustn't harm people. I know that. But uh, as far as helping is concerned, we have very thin uh, duties. We don't have much of an obligation to help other people. Uh-oh. And and so uh, against these people, I'm saying, look, suppose you are right. Suppose we have very little duty to help other people. This is not my issue. My issue is that you are doing far too much to harm people. Right. And so we as an organism, the whole country, we are harming people massively all over the world. Mm -hmm. Just like Nazi Germany was harming people in the entire European theater. And so it's a similar situation. The harm is certainly comparable. Uh, What is not comparable is the intent. You know, we are much better able to insulate ourselves and not to perceive how much harm we are doing. Yes, absolutely. In the Germans kind of knew somewhat better. Yeah, go ahead. Thomas, a uh, kind of closing statement because the Germans that are, the other Germans here, the party Germans, they're, uh, they, they, they want to party. They, want black. <laughs> they must party. Yeah. Uh, I'm sure you as a German are going to go blast your own techno as soon as you get off of this <laughs> Uh, I just want to say the I'm opening sort of question here is that is that uh, <laughs> that the people of the West are responsible for this. So, closing remark, and it is a big question, and we will have you on the show again because we've loved having you. We have so much more to talk just, about. It's so fun to talk to. Invaluable resource. I, I could find the amount of information and perspective and just you know personal experience that you have you know for so long. And I, I just I just have such appreciation for people in your field, for social scientists, for people who are just seriously working on this every single day that aren't some airheaded activist who is just blowing hot air about it. They're really doing the work. But so closing remark for our viewers. For, uh, closing remark. What can people in the West who are responsible, who do bear responsibility for this do 
beyond just uh, you know donating uh, for the price of a cup of coffee a day? What can we do about it right now going forward beyond just you know global interconnected, localized yet you know connected systemic change and models and all of these big picture stuff? What can we do right now? Yeah, I, I do think that uh, if we really want to do something that affects lasting change, we do have to organize ourselves together. So we have to mobilize and in one way or the other exert political influence together. And where to uh, exert it is a difficult question, right? Whether you uh, do it within the United States. So, for example, I'm involved in the movement to end uh, this unlimited funding for super PACs. Hugely important and uh, totally doable, right? So the court that has made uh, the, the important judgment about how uh, super PACs uh, are constitutionally entitled to unlimited funding because there is no fear of quid pro quo corruption, that uh, court simply made a reasoning mistake. And if we can get this reasoning mistake clarified for ordinary people, uh, we can make it so embarrassing that the Supreme Court ultimately will have to overrule this and has to concede that if campaign donations to individual candidates can be limited, as they are, of course, then donations to super PACs can also be limited. So this is one of the, you know, there are several, uh, very few, but a few very important levers where it is realistically possible to get the switch turned if we get enough political effort concentrated on those levers. And they will then change the balance of power not dramatically, but quite a bit, enough to give poor people more of a chance and more hope because so many people are demoralized. They say the politics is hopeless. There's nothing you can do. And we have to overcome that. We have to get to the point where we can say, look, we just did something. What you thought wasn't possible, it is possible. We did something. And uh, with what we did, we have brought other things that can also be done within easier reach. We can build on that, we can build on the momentum, and we can build on the redistribution of political power in order then to tilt the playing field further against the rich and in favor of the large majority. I'll, uh, I'll tell you what you guys can do. You can read and listen to people like Thomas and... Uh, mm can educate yourself better and ask these questions ask them throw yourself into them don't just trust that other people are dealing with it deal with it yourself because ultimately people of the western world as climate change intensifies as inequality ramps up as the gulf of power between the divide of power between us grows as we grow less powerful as the chaos in the world you know intensifies as the jingoism and the fear mongering and the pandemics and all these things rise you're next we're going to be in poverty just like the rest of the world so it's not you know the global poor and us it's we're all in it together baby do you want to do something about all the issues we talk about here on our show do you want to learn more get involved and help us help others break out of the cycle step one is to join the growing community of rebels and kind hearts sharing their knowledge and passion Follow Moneyless Society on our social media pages and spread the message to people who need it. When you're ready, you can get involved by reaching out and becoming a Moneyless Society volunteer. We need every skill imaginable, large or small, if we're going to resist the powers destroying our planet. And even if you don't have time to volunteer, you can help us build the dream with donations of any size. We create all of this community and content because it is our passion, but we need resources to get it done. Monthly Patreon donors receive cool perks like early access to future episodes, and visitors to our website, moneylesssociety.com, can buy MOSO shirts and other merchandise that help spread awareness. We're glad you're here, and we hope that you'll keep learning and growing with us. The goal may seem far away, but we can get there together.